bring some of this stuff online. Uh, and so that's where we're working towards next. And I, I'll, I'll just stop at that point and thank you. If you want to, if you want to check out the floating sheep, just floatingsheep.org. We're also active on Twitter as well. So I'll stop there. to each one of our speakers. Um, we will now open our session up to questions and answers for me. Questions? Yes, go. I want to thank you. It's very informative, all three. Uh, it's kind of eye -opener. Um, I guess I get all the virtues of the open access system. I'm always more interested in advice. <laughs> <laughs> Science getting more ideas out there it may be good, it may not be good if those ideas are not of a certain quality. And likewise, when there's so many more ideas in the public square, field, how can we as researchers manage that? So I guess I'm worried about to what extent you worry about the trade off in terms of quality of information. A few years ago, I recall reading a stat that 98% of the publications in the social sciences were never cited. So it isn't the case that those sciences are going to advance by getting more information out there. We need more better evidence. Not going to leave it at that. Well, you know, there's the, the, the issue, Phil, I think, is, is quality and quantity, obviously, uh, in part. And uh, at least, I think, in terms of some of the attributes of open access, it's key that you use the scientific uh, capacity you've got to make sure of the quality of that. And I illustrated that with the slide, and that is the, in, you know, the, the, the driving financial model for open access journals and for open access is to make money. Uh, so as a consequence, you know, they're interested in quantity. How many articles we can publish multiplied times that how, how much attorney or, you know, author fees we get uh, is one thing. So that, and, and it's interesting because there is an online site that actually has, this guy has listed all of the bad online journals. <laughs> uh, literally, he has those that are suspect, okay? And we know that when we started our journal, our open access journal, and I think it's true of things like PLOS, uh, some of the better online access journals, use exactly the same blasted peer review process. You know, you saw my slide on the new peer review process. But you use the same exact peer review process to referee articles for publication in an open access journal as you do with the regular journal. So the extent to which that is a mechanism for the controlling of quality I think is 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 there. The second thing is that obviously the reproducibility of your research is another uh, quality control uh, that most people have. And a lot of what we have discovered is in science, you know this as well as I do, you build off of somebody else's work to branch off into your own questioning. But as a part of that, you obviously have to kind of verify the point, starting point that you come from. And I think there is the opportunity with, with open access, just as with any journal, to blast the heck out of an author if it appears that uh, it's not leading you in the direction you want. So I think <clears throat> we've got a system that works out reasonably well, which is peer review, in terms of maintaining quality in the traditional journal world. And so we just have to apply the same controls that we have in the closed journal, print journal, to open access journals. Uh, well, I, I, I think the only thing, I mean, I, I agree with that uh, completely. I think the only thing I might add in addition <coughs> is that 
this sort of stuff is going to get out there whether or not there's open access journals or not that are being done by academics. I mean, they're, I mean the web is open in lots of ways, and so people can start their own journal without any real back, and they, obviously they have. There's all these open, open access. The other thing, I mean, I, I, just to echo the whole peer review, because I think this is pretty fundamental, because, I mean, if, when you see what is happening within the way the web is developed, it's essentially taking the peer review model from academia and, you know, applied it to Facebook likes or Yelp reviews or what, what have you. So it's th still the same sort of peer review. I think the one thing that could be perhaps done within sort of academic peer reviewed rankings and things like that is, you know, do a more some sort of assessment of, you know, it's not just a matter that someone was, it, it, it's not just about being sort of cited, it's sort of the, the value of that citation. Because, I mean, there's ways to game the system. You can go out and if you want to create these sort of fictitious <laughs> papers that are citing yourself, um, and inflate your citation score. Um, I mean, and there's in some really interesting uh, articles out of computer science of people who've done exactly that. Then they've run into problems because they've artificially inflated their score and they can't uninflate it. So it's a <laughs> but, but you could take that and have some more nuance with, I mean, just as Google algorithms and how, how it goes about ranking things uh, is really sophisticated. It has lots and lots of variables. You could certainly imagine a similar kind of ranking that is done or sort of accepted by um, uh, peer-reviewed journals uh, as a way to sort of adjust for that. Like, uh, take that list of journals that are worthless and you know just exclude them from anything, which is sort of happening already. It's it's interesting though. I you know your comment about the number of citations. Obviously, your ISI, which is calculated by you know the Web of Science is what editors live and die on. And, you know, it is obviously possible to game the system. I mean, if you're an editor, you know, what you want to do is make sure that the paper that you get and you finally publish has citations from your journal in it so that, you know, it'll raise your ISI. So even with the print publication, I have seen gaming done by journal editors who say, by the way, you haven't cited these four articles, which are key to making us sure that that you've covered the literature adequately. And those four citations, oddly enough, are in the journal that he publishes or she publishes. I, I, I am shocked, absolutely shocked, <laughs> uh, to find that this is going on. I think additionally, the transparency issues that Dr. Scutchfield mentions, it's it's um, it's less. Uh, you're less able to game it if your data is out there and people can look at it and reproduce it. I mean, that's the whole idea. And they were finding that it, it's more difficult in an open environment to do that gaming. And there are other mes um, measures in addition to this ISA, this whole ISI, the whole alt metrics, looking at how things are cited and in a new digital environment, I think that really makes a difference too and will impact our um, young scholars coming up through the system. Okay, yes. So, thank you for these, these talks. I, I love the power of open source journals, data source software, I think it's fantastic. But a common theme that came up was finding resources to support it. <laughs> so, I mean, to me, things useful for other people takes a lot of time. And sometimes I think that we can get ahead of the, the funding agencies and so on. So we put a lot of work into it. And it's just hard to, to support it. So I don't think there are easy answers to this, but I'm wondering your thoughts about the ways to raise money to, to pay for time to work on well, you know, it's interesting because one of the reasons I published or that put that slide up there about the publishing paradigm. You know, libraries are about information. Information storing, management, dissemination, et cetera. And for example, right now I'm struggling, obviously, with finding the box to do the HTML conversion. Well, wait a minute. We've got a site license. The University of Kentucky Library is bought from B Press, the University of California Press. Surely to God, there are other people like me that are trying to go through the business of getting the damn journal on, on, on PubMed. So they're struggling with how the heck are we going to get this thing converted to HTML from Word? And why, you know, why the library system? Because it's University of California library system that runs B Press. Why the libraries don't rise up 
in, in, in anger and say, wait a minute, uh, you guys, the University of Kentucky pays your salary, it's your intellectual, it's our University of Kentucky money that pays for that. By Joe, we want to make sure that it's available and we, the arbiters of information flow, collection, dissemination, et cetera, as libraries have a responsibility there. Not only that, you know, God, again, thank you for Robert. I mean, we, what we, we are now part of an experiment, basically, that NLM has done to make the cost of a series of journals zero for full access, full tax access to public health professionals in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. It's an experiment. Uh, NIH, NIH, God love them, said, you know, uh, if you publish, if you publish, or if you publish with NIH money, you will put it on PubMed, and it will be free. So if you go to UK's library site and on PubMed, you're likely to find a tag that says free on PMC. Uh, so you know what we've got to do is look for these new business models that the president or the provost says, wait a minute, <laughs> what am I doing? buying back the intellectual capital of somebody whose salary I pay. That's stupid. Let's figure out how this works. And I think if a consortium of research universities decided, wait a minute, this is not the way we ought to be do doing business, not a good business model, you could change the business model. Now, it's, that's way to hell above my pay grade, but I still think it's something that needs to be considered by research one institutions. And yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, I love the call for sort of a revolution uh, within uh, <laughs> the academic pub uh, publishing industry. I mean, I, but it's also, I mean, it's really tough because particularly uh, people publish in the top journals because we it's publish or perish. And, yes. and it's the, the, the question, is that open source? Because and, 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 open source journals, there are some good, really good open source yes. journals. Uh, but, you know, no, wondering whether or not your tenure review committee is actually going to be know that that's a good one or not. Uh, that's, that's where it gets kind of difficult. I mean, yeah, so I think it, it's, I, I think efforts like, uh, you know, this, this whole idea of trying to get people to redirect some of the publications away from the ones that are running, you know, certain models to another one. But it gets tricky because the, the, those journals, they, they have these systems now where there's the top journals, you can pay to have your uh, article be open access. Which, if you have funding, that's great. In my particular field, in the fun main funding agency we have is the National Science Foundation. And we, there's not a lot of funding there, quite honestly. Um, and so to pay a thousand, two thousand dollars or whatever for a publication, that's, that's a real challenge coming uh, from my particular field. Uh, and, you know, and also, that's not really quite open access because, you know, the, some, oh, someone else is paying, but you know the 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 the, the, the journal journals. publishers are still getting making money. money. Yeah. Whereas, <laughs> yeah. So that that's an issue. I mean, and just a, the other thing, and just one of, one of the strategies. One of the reasons I've been happy to pass on data to lots of different people is because I figure, like, well, we'll see what happens. If something really interesting comes out, well, that would be, you know, then they're going to need or want more data, and then. Well, I'd love to be part of something like that, or you know, get a chance to. And it's also good for interdisciplinary stuff as well. So that's been a person, you know, a personal strategy of mine, uh, but I'm not necessarily works in all cases. Intersecting this issue as well, uh, back in, I guess it was February of 2013, the White House Office for Science and Technology po Policy put out an executive order requiring funding federal funding agencies to put into place within six months, they said, um, a plan for sharing data and sharing publications, a requirement for any federal grant with a threshold over $100 million, which certainly um, means National Science Foundation, NIH, NEH, and the like. And so there, um, here it is a year and a half later, and these agencies are still sort of struggling with this and making these plans. Um, but NSF is indeed got a plan together, and they've now submitted it to the White House office for approval. But this overlaying this is going to be a requirement for every NSF grant that 
that the results be published and made open access in some way and shared. It could be with an embargo period. It could be that the publish and publishers are now getting on board saying, okay, after an embargo period, we will make it available, free and open available, because taxpayers do not want to pay twice. They don't want to pay twice. And so, um, and it's publicly acknowledged that science advanced faster, uh, advances faster with open access to the research. So I think this uh, public policy overlaying this is going to impact this issue a great deal. Now, it doesn't answer the question of who's going to pay and how is this going to be paid. Um, NSF is saying, oh, it could be a direct charge for your grants, but that means you have less money to actually do the science if you have to carve out a piece of this. So it's, that still remains to be seen what overall, who's going to pay and how is it going to get paid for, because there is a cost. Nothing is free. And, um, but I, it'll be interesting to see how these policies roll out. Um, I, I think we could continue for the next half hour or even hour with more questions and, and answers with our panelists, but unfortunately we have come to the end of our, our formal Q&A session. However, we do invite each of you next door to the alumni gallery um, for uh, free uh, snacks, <laughs> coffee and cookies and so on, at which point you can continue uh, questions and, and comments with our panelists. Um, thank, thank you to everyone who came this morning, and please join me in thanking each of our panelists for their presentations.